Well, good morning. Again, we'd like to welcome you to North Isani Baptist Church. We're grateful for each of you to come. Uh, Let's take a moment before we open God's word to offer a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. God, for an opportunity again to um, work through the book of Exodus. Um, God, understanding, Lord, that it is about salvation. It is about a time, Lord, we, where, where a nation was, a people was saved. But, Lord, it was also about your saving power. And, Lord, ultimately, God, what you were saving them from. And, and, and God, and even an eternal salvation that is yet to come. God, we see the shadows throughout, Lord, that are so applicable to our lives today. And so, Father, as we, as we open up your, your holy word, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us, God filling us, uniting us, um, blessing us, Jesus, with the strength of your power and understanding and wisdom to understand, uh, Lord, the, the goodness found in your word. We pray that you will do this for your glory, and in Jesus' name, amen. So I'm actually going to start our sermon off with a quote from one of my commentaries on a text that we'll be studying today. And it's going to set the stage a little bit for a tension that we're going to have to work through in Exodus 19. And so Philip Ryken says the following, and, and he uses some big words, but, but, I, but, but hang in there with me. Some periods of church, and, church history have emphasized God's transcendence, meaning his distance from his creatures because of his holiness and his greatness. To transcend means to go beyond. Transcendence is otherliness and separateness from everything that he's made. When people see God as transcendent, they approach him with awe and wonder. This was true in the Middle Ages when great cathedrals were built to to praise God's lofty majesty. At other times, the church has emphasized God's eminence, which means or which refers to his nearness and his relatedness to his creatures. Imminent comes from the Latin verb meaning to remain in. So to speak of God's imminence, therefore, is to speak of his close personal involvement and interaction with his creation. When people see God as imminent, they approach him with confidence, expecting to experience the intimacy of his personal presence. The truth is, God is both transcendent and eminent. He is exalted above everything that he has made, and at the same time, he is intimately involved with everything that happens in the universe. Both of these things are true about God. The trouble is that the church usually tends to emphasize one at the expense of the other. Not only do we tend to emphasize one over the other through different periods in church history, but this dynamic may also kind of look like a pendulum swinging from one generation to the next. One generation focuses on reverence, proper dress, and decorum fixated on the holiness and the reverence of God. They may then birth children drawn to the Jesus movement of the 70s. Parents who raise their kids in churches focused on obedience to the commands of God may birth children focused on knowing God. And yet if they're not careful, some focused on intimacy with God may create a loving God devoid or robbed of his transcendence or holiness. Or others are focused on God's otherliness and may may know much about God, but they fail to develop a relationship with God. And so this often causes generational divides within the church where one generation is critical of one group's flippancy while the next disparages another's solemn yet joyless existence. Now, if this seems complicated for us to navigate, it must have been infinitely more difficult for God to reveal his love and holiness to humanity in our sinful condition. And so in our text today, God does just that. Now, since leaving Egypt, 
the Israelites had begun to develop a little bit of a flippancy towards God and his holiness. They had been in the wilderness for about two months, and during that time, they had witnessed the deliverance and the provision of God, and yet in each instance of God's faithfulness, they, they, they grew seemingly more brash in their complaints and their accusations, even once threatening to kill Moses and leave his body in the wilderness while they went back to Egypt. And after these incidents, the, the group finally arrived at the mountain of God, and they camped on the base of this mountain, and they waited for God's instructions to Moses. And so we're going to read what happened in chapter 19, verses 1 through 8. Exactly two months after the Israelites left Egypt, they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. And after breaking camp at Rephidim, they, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and set up camp there at the base of Mount Sinai. Then Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God. The Lord called him from the mountain and said, Give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among the peoples of the earth. For all the earth belongs to me. And you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message that you must give the people of Israel. And so Moses returned to the mountain and called together the people of the elders of the people and told them everything the Lord commanded him. And all the people responded together, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. And so Moses brought the people's answers back to the Lord, answer back to the Lord. And so God instructed the Israelites regarding their response to salvation. Remember, Moses ascended the mountain to have a conversation with God. Now, he was instructed to make an announcement to the Israelites. Now, verse 4 is critical to understanding this text this week and next week as then we examine the Ten Commandments. Let me reread it for you. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Let's pause. Salv their salvation was achieved for them. They didn't work for it. They didn't produce it. And they didn't earn it. Salvation is, was, and will forever be an act of God. But as we'll see in this text... It is also an act that demands a response that comes with a promise. The response is obedience and solidarity regarding the covenant he made with Abraham. But the promise is incredible. If they obey and keep the covenant, they will be his special treasure among all the people of the earth. They will be a kingdom of priests. Through their work and obedience, the entire world will see the goodness of God. And after hearing God's words, Moses gave God's proposal to the Israelites, and their response was naively positive. We will do everything the Lord has commanded. And so Moses brought the people's answer back to the Lord. See, God will not force himself on a people. A relationship with himself is an invitation that they have to respond to. He will come close, but still appear somewhat veiled. Well, God further describes his arrival. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will come to you in a thick cloud, Mo uh, cloud, Moses, so the people themselves can hear me when I speak with you. Then they will always trust you. Again, God is holy. And in our sinful state, we cannot see his face and live. The dark cloud must have appeared really, really ominous. Imagine, you're at the bottom of a mountain. But its presence allowed God to come close enough for the Israelites to hear him while not so close that they would be destroyed. Now, the cloud also communicates the mystery of God. They, now, these, these Israelites, they're going to be able to know much about God, more than anywhere else, anyone else in all the earth, but, but not all that there is to know about him. He remains veiled, and his arrival also differentiates him from other gods. He didn't live on the mountain like the gods on Mount Olympus. He was higher and above them, and he had to actually descend even to come down to a mountain. And this moment will also be an important for another reason. The people need to witness God speaking and delivering his commandments to Moses. 
Now, many religions have been born out of genuine seekers of truth heading off into the wilderness to ponder the mysteries of life. And they may return with great revelation or insight. And and in this instance, God wants to make it perfectly clear that the instructions given to Moses are not born out of human insight or reflection, but come directly from God himself. And when they hear the conversation, they will trust the exchange as genuine and not fabricated by Moses. They, now, they must now begin to prepare for God's arrival. So God had revealed himself in a burning bush to Moses, a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night to the Israelites. This image led the Israelites throughout the wilderness from camp to camp, and they were preparing for God to come much, much closer. And how should they respond when God comes near? Well, let's read again, starting in verse 9. Moses told the people what the, told the Lord what the people had said. And then the Lord said to Moses, well, go down and prepare the people for my arrival. Consecrate them today and tomorrow and have them wash their clothing. Be sure that they are ready on the third day, for on that day the Lord will come down on the mountain Sinai as the people watch. Mark off a boundary all around the mountain. Warn the people, be careful. Do not go up the mountain or even touch its boundaries. Anyone who touches the mountain will certainly be put to death. No hand may touch the person or animal that crosses the boundary. Instead, stone them or shoot them with arrows. They must be put to death. However, when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, then the people may go up the mountain. So Moses went down to the people and he consecrated them for worship and washed their clothes. He told them, get ready for the third day and until then abstain from having sexual intercourse. And so they have three days to prepare for God to descend on this mountain. First, they're supposed to wash their clothing. Now, this isn't an ancient mandate to wear a suit and a tie and a long dress to Sunday worship. This is an outward act intended to reflect an inward righteousness. And secondly, they were to set up a boundary around the mountain's base. They weren't to explore. They weren't to climb. They weren't even supposed to get close to the edge. They were to be hyper aware of God's coming. Any person or animal crossing the boundary was supposed to be put to death, but but they weren't supposed to chase him down like, oh no, don't go there, I'll grab you. No, you're supposed to shoot him with an arrow. You know, whether someone was drifting past the boundary or defiantly approaching the line, they were to stone them again or, 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 or shoot them with an arrow. They mustn't lose their chance to experience God's approach by chasing an animal or a person down. And lastly, they were abstained from sexual intercourse. Now, this isn't intended in any way to communicate God's disapproval of sexuality. It's, it is appropriate when enjoyed within the co- covenant of marriage. Their abstinence was designed to point them to a more significant relationship and a more important covenant. It would also allow them to give their undivided attention to the details of God's law and covenant. They were to wait until they heard the sound of a ram's horn, and then they could approach the mountain. Now, I grew up in thunderstorm country, right? Like Kansas, that's, all, that's what we do for enjoyment. So you walk out and you see the clouds would slowly start to darken, and then lightning would begin to fill the sky. Thunder would begin to crack the silence, and, and rain or hail, unfortunately, would pour down from the sky. And if you aren't used to a thunderstorm, it can be really, really frightening. Now, I assume a Kansas thunderstorm is the equivalent of a cool breeze compared to the ominous buildup on the mountain over those few days. Because on the third day, God descended on Mount Sinai. Day one and day two of their consecration paled in comparison to what they were about to witness. Because on the morning of the third day, thunder roared and lightning flashed and a dense cloud came down the mountain. There was a long, loud blast from a ram's horn and all the people trembled. Moses led them out from the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. All of Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it in the form of fire. 
The smoke billowed into the sky like smoke from, the, from a brick kiln, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God thundered his reply. The Lord came down on the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain, and so Moses climbed the mountain. Then the Lord told Moses, go back down and warn the people not to break through the boundaries to see the Lord, or they will die. Even the priests who regularly come near the Lord must purify themselves so that the Lord does not break out against them and destroy them. But Lord, Moses protested, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai. You already warned us. You told me, mark off the boundaries all around the mountain and set it apart as holy. But the Lord said, go down and bring back up, bring Aaron back up with you. In the meantime, do not let the priests or the people break through and approach the Lord or he will break out and destroy them. So Moses went down to the people and told them what the Lord had said. Thunder lightning and a dense cloud were accompanied by the sound of a ram's horn. The length and the volume of the blast of that horn caused the entire group to grow increasingly afraid of what was happening around them. Now you may be asking me right now, who blew that ram's horn? And the answer is, I have no idea. Which also may have further increased their terror. Because Moses led the people, then Moses led the people out of the camp to the mountain's base. They, they witnessed the God of the universe take the form of fire on that mountain. If the lightning and the thunder and the billowing smoke and the fire weren't enough to terrify the onlookers, the entire mountain then began to shake and tremble underneath them while the volume of the ram's horde began to increase. Now, I can only postulate, but I wonder if the sound that they heard was constant and without breath. And if that were true, then this could be no human that was producing the noise in the background. Instead, a, a, a being capable of praising God without needing to breathe. And with this as the backdrop, Moses spoke to the Lord, and he invited him to the top of the mountain. And when Moses arrived at the top of the mountain, divine hum, humor here, when Moses arrived at the top of the mountain, God told him to go back down and give them further instructions. Now, please take a moment to appreciate Moses' response. But Lord, the people ca cannot come up Mount Sinai. You already told us. You already warned us. You told me, mark off a boundary all around the mountain to set it apart as holy. In other words, you mean to tell me I claimed all the way up here to the top of this mountain in my 80s, and you're asking me to go back down the mountain and tell the people something that you already told them they had to do? Now, as a man who uses an app to turn off my bedroom lamp because I'm too lazy to walk five feet, I understand Moses' hesitancy. Now, that being said, the Israelites had a track record of disobeying God. And the stakes in this case were higher than moldy manna and a smelly tent. And my guess is, is that God knew something about human nature that Moses had yet to comprehend. And that is, is that we can acclimate and normalize anything. Whether it be the sound of a shofar blowing, the earth trembling, or the fire, or the smoke on the mountain, once we realize we're not dead, our fear begins to dissipate, and we begin to be tempted to explore the mountain further. This would be a deadly mistake, and Moses needed to return and remind the people, and as well as the priests, of this truth. This isn't a typical day. Everyone, including the priest, probably the eldest born in each family, must prepare for this moment. And he has to return with Aaron. Now, Philip Ryken explains what could possibly be the reasoning behind Aaron's invitation to the top of the mountain. He says, as Aaron has, been all, has already been serving as Moses' spokesman, now God was preparing him for his ministry as high priest. With Moses, he was permitted to go up the holy mountain and meet with God, and later Aaron would do the same thing in the tabernacle. When the tabernacle was built, the people kept their distance, standing outside the boundaries of God's holy dwelling. But one man, the high priest, was permitted to enter into the holy of holies and meet with God. Thus, the tabernacle had the same spiritual structure, so to speak, as Mount Sinai. The people stood at a distance while their mediator met with God. 
In this way, God's people learned what is required for coming into God's presence. We must be careful how we approach him. Only the mediator whom God has chosen can lead us to the most holy place. And so Moses went down the mountain and helped position the people in a place where they could hear from God and live. But before we we move toward application today, and before we move to the Ten Commandments next week, again, I want to remind you that this is the context in which the Ten Commandments were given. Now, we grew up with the Ten Commandments on bookmarks. Maybe we put them on stone monuments. Or if you're old enough, it may have even been a paper posted in your, in your classroom at school. When these instructions were first presented, they came with the terrorizing presence of God on this mountain. And so let's take a few moments and examine how we could apply this text today. And to be honest... This passage may may be one of the most challenging but essential texts in all of Scripture to grapple through. What do we do with a God of fire, lightning, thunder, smoke, and earthquakes? How does it exist? How does this image coexist with the tender compassion of Jesus? How do we walk in in New Testament reality, living in the tension of God's imminence and transcendence? Now, we'll work through two New Testament passages that will help us navigate our relationship with God well. And let's start by comparing a couple mountains. And the first point of application today is, remember that in Christ, you have come to a different mountain. The writer of Hebrews says the following to a New Testament Jewish audience. It says this, You have not come to a physical mountain, to a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom, and whirlwind as the Israelites did at Mount Sinai, for they heard an awesome trumpet blast and a voice so terrible that they begged God to stop speaking. They staggered back under God's commandment. Even if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. Moses himself was so frightened at the sight that he said, I am terrified and trembling. No. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, and the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in joyful gathering. You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God himself, who is the judge over all things. You have come to the spirits of of the righteous ones in heaven who have now been made perfect. You've come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. Be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, will we certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven? When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth, but now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. And since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. For our God, for our God, is a devouring fire. Now one of the nuances of our individualistic American minds tends to ignore the ancient cities, that, or tends to ignore that Ancient cities and worship of deities often happened on mountains or high places. They would organize their societies, their cities on elevated terrain. And in these places, they would form societies and identify and identities that would be unique from other people groups. See, when God visited the people at Sinai, he did the same thing. 
He, was, he meant to give them a law intended to identify them as God's chosen people. And so corporately, they were to be priests showing others the goodness of God. Their behaviors did not save them, but demonstrated that they understood what God was saving them from. They were to be a countercultural community. And they failed. They assimilated into the culture and they ended up becoming like it. Their story highlighted the need for a new and a better mediator than Moses, a new and better high priest than Aaron, and a new and better king than David. And so Jesus has brought us to a new mountain, much different than the one at Sinai, where everyone was scared to death at God's approach. His closeness exposed their sin, and a wrong move might represent the end of their lives. And yet contrast that to the words describing Mount Zion, a spiritual, though someday again physical, mountain. It was a city filled with countless angels rejoicing. We come as firstborn children inheriting a future that we did not earn and join others who have gone before us years, centuries, even millennial past. We will enter a place where there will be no more death. God is still the judge, but we have a new mediator in Christ. The consequences of sin and injustice have been crying out. When something awful happened, when murder happened, that blood cries out for vengeance all the way back to the time of Abel when he was slain by his brother. And yet now there's a new blood sprinkled on this mountain. It's the blood of Christ that instead speaks of our forgiveness. See, Mount Zion, as opposed to Mount Sinai, will be a place of peace with God, a place that he can come near without terrifying us. And yet the author of Hebrews' conclusion to this reality is an important warning, including to us. He says, be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. See, if our real life is on a mountain in a city yet to come, we must prepare now for that day by living holy and obedient lives. If there were consequences to ignoring Moses' words then, how much more dire so the words of Jesus now? When God spoke at Sinai, the mountain shook. And scripture points to a shaking much more substantial than the one during the time of Moses. There will be a day when God shakes not only the earth, but the heavens as well and destroys them both. And all that is wrong when this world will disappear and he will create a new heaven and a new earth, a world filled with his righteousness. Only the unshakable will survive. Let me reread the Bible's admonition regarding living our lives now with this future in mind. It says this, since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe, for our God is a devouring fire. Our response as Christ followers should be gratitude and holy fear. God's character has not changed. He always has been and always will be a holy God. He was at Sinai and will be at Zion, a consuming fire. And that leads to our last point today, and that is to develop a healthy and proper fear of God. <clears throat> now, the idea of, of the fear of God is often misunderstood in the church. The book of Proverbs begins by reminding us that the beginning of all wisdom is the fear of God. And yet, the struggle with what the, we struggle with what this means. Are we in commanded to be or encouraged to be scared of God? Others believe the fear of God is intended to be more like an ah, oh, reverence. Ooh, right? And then we might read texts that, that seem to discourage the fear of God. Like 1 John 4, 16 through 19 says, God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect 
So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in the world. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we're afraid, it's for the fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced God's perfect love. And so in this text, John reminds us of God's eminence, his closeness. He desires to be close to us. And in Christ, we can come near to God, for God is love. And when we live in him and we live in his love, or when we live in him, we live in his love. And so how do we both love and fear God? Now in this text... John describes a process that we're all intended to go through in our relationship with God. But the process is connected with an event, and that is the day of judgment. And often lost in our understanding of God's salvation is a misunderstanding of God's judgment. We rightfully deduce that God's salvation saves us from the eternal separation from God in hell, we wrongfully assume that there will be no judgment for you and I as the believer. 1 Peter 1 speaks to the judgment of believers. It says, and remember that the heavenly father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time as foreigners in the land for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you were living and the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver it was a sinless spotless lamb of God God chose him as your ransom long before the world began but has now revealed him to you in these last days for all to see see in both Hebrews passage and in this one it refers to the fear of God as as a motivating factor in our lives I will stand before God someday and give account for everything that I have done and thought and not done in my life. What, I'm sorry, I will stand and give account for what I've done with my life and, give, and the gift of salvation given to me in Christ. In fact, Jesus says it will be exposed for all people to see. Things whispered in the dark will be shouted from the mountaintops. Everything we've done or failed to do will be exposed to the fire of God's judgment. And this should develop a healthy fear in our lives because we will either be judged or rewarded according to what we have done. Now, I no longer fear the eternal wrath of God, but the fear of God, God's sifting of my life does impact what I do now in preparation for that day. Did I serve God while I was here? Did I serve myself? Was my money used only for my pleasure, or did I grow to be generous with what I was entrusted with? Was I quick to forgive, or did I grow bitter towards others? Did I see others as God saw them, or did I harbor a judgmental attitude? And scripture is, fear, is, scripture is clear. This is the beginning of wisdom. It helps restrain the desires of the flesh and entices obedience, but it doesn't end there. Because see, over time, as we remain in God's perfect love, this fear is slowly replaced. John even says that perfect love drives out all fear. See, it's about our motivation for our behaviors. It, it's good and it's right to allow the day of judgment to impact how we serve, how we give, how we obey, but it shouldn't be the sole motivation for our work. It is the love of Christ that should compel us this is why learning how to pray is so important. This is why allowing the gospel to renew your mind is so critical. It's why allowing ourselves to be loved by God in our broken state is necessary for our growth. Our flesh has been crucified, but it isn't dead yet. It still screams out, begging us to indulge in this temporal world. The wrath of God is squarely focused on eradicating this part of our life. The fire of God's holiness burns against our selfishness, first because he hates sin, but secondly because he sees what we don't. That real life isn't, isn't found until this world is shaken 
and we are fairly and justly rewarded for what we do. Now, can I be vulnerable with you for a minute? I'm not there. I want the love of God to compel me, but there are times when my motivation is still the fear of God. And to that extent, I suppose there's all, it'll always be that way to some extent until the day of judgment. But there may be also moments where my actions show I, I don't love God or fear him. But I hope to grow. I want my actions to reflect a man who loves God and is loved by God. And John reminds us of how this happens. He says, so we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence. Hear this part. Because we live like Jesus lived in this world. One of my greatest hopes as your pastor is that someday on the day of judgment, you as the people I served will not cower in fear where he has to coax you towards him. But you will see the fire of God and you'll run to it with arms open wide. But see, this happens first when you switch mountains. See, God hasn't changed, and if your heart hasn't submitted to him, you're on the wrong mountain. God's approach will mirror the experience of Sinai. You will be terrified and desire to run from God, and hell will be the only place you can escape that type of a presence. And for the believer, we still start by fearing this day, which alters our moral behavior, but as the love of Christ fills our life, fear begins to dissipate. And we can face this day with confidence because we will live like Jesus did in this world. Don't end with moral conformity. Let the love of Christ compel you to live under his kingdom authority. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day and an opportunity to, um, to go through a, a, a not an easy passage. Um, one that's a little bit scary and one that seems incongruous to, Lord, what? incongruent, Lord, to what uh, we saw in the person of Jesus. And yet, Lord, when you came and when Jesus came, fully God and fully man, he never once minimized your holiness. He never once diminished your fire. Instead, he satisfied it. Instead, he became our high priest. He became our mediator. And he became the blood that instead of cries out for vengeance, offers forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.